Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers a Diels-Alder reaction experiment. This is part 3, Recrystallization and Melting Point Analysis. In a previous video, I covered setting up a reflux apparatus and carrying out the Diels-Alder reaction, followed by isolating the product. In this video, I'll cover recrystallizing the Diels-Alder product and taking its melting point. I'll be doing the recrystallization in a small Erlenmeyer flask. The next step is to transfer the crystals into the Erlenmeyer flask. Here I'm using a powder funnel to make it a little easier to get them in. I'll be using a mixed solvent system for this recrystallization. That involves using a good solvent, xylene, along with a poor solvent, petroleum ether. The good solvent dissolves the product really well, the poor solvent dissolves it really poorly, and when I mix these two I can find a solvent that has just the right characteristics to recrystallize the product. It should be a good solvent when it's hot, but a poor solvent when it's cold. To start off with, I'll be measuring out 6 milliliters of xylene and pouring that in. This is the good solvent, and adding 6 milliliters of xylene nearly dissolves the product. Now I'm placing the flask on a hot plate, and I'm turning on the heat to get it to boil. Once it's boiling, and I can see there's no more solid left, I'll take the flask off and set it off to the side. Then I'll add the pour solvent petroleum ether. Now I'm adding petroleum ether to the solution, one pipette full at a time, giving it a swirl. I'm looking for the product to start phase separating here. Sometimes that appears as a cloudiness first and then crystals. I can see a few crystals start to develop in the flask, so I'm done adding petroleum ether. Now I'll just watch and wait for the crystals to grow. It's a good idea to allow the solution to cool to room temperature on its own slowly. Crystals that grow slowly tend to be of better quality and higher purity. Now the recrystallization is complete, and I have a flask full of colorless needles of the Diels Alder product, tetrahydrothalic anhydride. I'll vacuum filter these crystals like I did before. Here I'm showing a top view for a little bit different perspective. I've already turned on the water aspirator, so the vacuum is on at this point. I'm pushing the filter paper down to seat it against the Buchner funnel. And I'll swirl and pour to filter the crystals. The crystals will initially be wet with solvent, so it's a good idea to continue to run the vacuum for at least 5, maybe 10 minutes to dry out that residual solvent. Wet crystals will result in yields that are too high and melting points that are too low and broadened. Here again, I'm removing the hose to break the vacuum before I turn off the faucet. This prevents water from flowing into the filter flask. I'll be weighing out my product on a watch glass here. So I put the watch glass on the balance, I tear it, and I'll scrape the crystals onto the watch glass to get their mass. I'm going to give you a close-up of the crystals here so you can see their morphology and color. I would describe these as colorless needles. I'll need to grind these crystals to a powder to carry out the melting point determination. They need to be powderized in order to get them into the melting point capillary tube, and it's important that the powder pack together in the capillary tube during the melting point determination as well. Once the crystals are powderized, I'll take a melting point capillary, which is a tube that's open at one end, and jam the open end into the powder that I just made. This will force some of the powder into the capillary tube. Then I could tip it right side up and tap it on the bench to force the powder down into the end of the tube. Another strategy is to bounce the melting point capillary in a glass tube on the bench. The bouncing action forces the solid down into the tip of the capillary and packs it together. You don't need a lot of sample in the melting point capillary. A 1 or 2 millimeter tall sample will work. You just have to be able to see it. Now I have the sample loaded into a melting point apparatus. In this apparatus, the tube sits in an oil bath that's stirred by a stirrer below, so you're seeing a little bit of debris flying by the melting point tube here. The big silver object in the middle is the thermometer bulb. The temperature of the apparatus needs to rise fairly slowly near the melting point, ideally rising at a rate of 1 to 2 degrees per minute near the melting point of the solid. This ends up being a long process, and melting point determinations tend to take a long time. What I'm doing here is showing you a little snippet of the most interesting part of the melting point determination, and it's sped up a little bit for purposes of this video. When you actually determine a melting point in the lab, you'll go much more slowly than this, increasing temperature at a rate of about 1 to 2 degrees Celsius per minute. Remember that melting point is a range of temperatures. When you see the first drop of liquid, record the temperature. Then, when the last bit of solid disappears and it's all liquid, record that temperature as well. 
The melting point range represents a slushy state of the material where solid and liquid coexist. The range can tell you about the purity of the sample. If your melting point range is greater than about 4 degrees, it indicates your sample is probably not pure. This concludes the Diels Alder experiment. Stay tuned for other experiments that will be described in subsequent videos. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video, and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.